Bible says, quote, At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. End quote. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. Beloved of God, in this awesome passage from the Gospel of Matthew, our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, delivers the glad tidings so cherished by believers in Scripture alone and justification by faith alone, yet so hated by popes, papists, monks, and even the deceived Protestant neo-legalists, such as those unsaved persons trusting in their heresies, such as Lordship Salvation, the New Perspective on Paul, Vantillianism, Federal Vision, and so on. By the grace of God, we will expose and reject the papist misreading of this passage by all those heretics, whoever they may profess to be, both vivers and wolves, who serve Antichrist with their false gospel of justification by faith and works. We will attend to that apologetic matter shortly. But, before we come to that, we shall hear the blessed truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, quote, At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes, end quote. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. That God has hidden the doctrine of Scripture alone, the proper distinction between law and gospel, and justification by faith alone, which is the gospel in its proper and saving sense, that He has hidden this from the wise and prudent of this world, while revealing His saving truth to the babes of this world, is a matter of sheer sovereign grace and God's absolute predestination of all things. The effectual word of God always accomplishes the conversion of God's elect and simultaneously the hardening of the reprobate and at the appointed time. The Bible says, quote, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. End quote. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. This wretched world is filled with multitudes of unsaved men who are wise and prudent, not only in their own eyes, but in the eyes of their lost colleagues, too. Many of these wise men proudly make up the world's legions of college professors and academics who teach atheism, agnosticism, Marxism, Darwinian evolution, and other vain philosophies after the tradition of men. They proudly tell us that they are too wise to believe the teachings of Scripture alone. They think their intellects are too keen to believe the teachings found in the Bible alone. However, Jesus tells us that the true reason these wise men do not believe the doctrines found in the Bible is that those doctrines have been hidden from them. The Bible says, quote, He hath blinded their eyes, 
and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them End quote. John chapter 12 verse 40 God the Father has deliberately hidden the truth from these non-believers God has done this on purpose and for his glory this hiding is not the result of human free will for there is no such thing whatsoever comes to pass happens necessarily as God Almighty executes his eternal decrees the scope of God's determinate counsel includes all angelic and human history see Isaiah chapter 46 verses 10 through 11 and Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 even the devil and his demons are determined by God Almighty and will do God's omnipotent will see Job chapter 1 verses 6 through 12 first Kings chapter 22 verses 19 through 23 the Bible says quote but if our gospel be hid it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them in quote second Corinthians chapter 4 verses 3 through 4 you see God has determined who will believe his gospel and at the exact time he or she will believe it those God has determined to believe the gospel will have the gospel sent to them and will be given faith at that appointed time the Holy Spirit uses the reading and the preaching of the law to create contrition in the elect and then the Holy Ghost uses the reading and the preaching of the gospel to quicken the elect to regenerate them to create saving faith in them causing them to understand and receive the good news of Jesus Christ for them the justification of the elect before God though it began in eternity with God's foreordained purpose it terminates in time the moment the elect believe the gospel the Bible says quote moreover whom he did predestinate them he also called and whom he called them he also justified and whom he justified them he also glorified End quote. book of Romans chapter 8 verse 30 beloved when Jesus Christ is revealed to the elect then he is hidden no more the elect are given eyes to see and ears to hear the Holy Spirit creates faith in them to believe the gospel is the fruit of the Spirit it is not something a dead sinner can manufacture within himself the Bible says quote a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them in quote Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 26 through 27 the Bible also says quote but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor the will of man but of God End quote. John chapter 1 verses 12 through 13 my friends these babes whom God reveals the gospel to are often the poor weak and despised of this world they are frequently considered to be foolish by the wise of this world the spiritually blind of this world mock and persecute them God often utilizes the weak and the insignificant of this world to shame the mighty in vain the Bible says quote 
But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. End quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 27 Such precise providential governing of all of creation and all the actions of every creature can only be from an omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent God. The Lord is for us. Who can be against us? The Lord is our shepherd. Though we are surrounded by a host of demons and enemies, our good shepherd protects us and prepares a table, a great table before us. Our cup overflows. The Bible says, quote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. End quote. Psalm 23. The Bible also says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. End quote. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. Now my friends, the salvation of Christ is revealed to babes, to the sheep. Babes are helpless and cannot do for themselves. They depend every moment on their parents or they perish. The sheep are helpless without their shepherd without their shepherd to tend and to save them. These are the Bible's metaphors to describe God's elect. You see, the elect cannot save themselves. They are born in sin, unable and incapable. Their entire salvation, from start to finish, depends on God's grace alone. Why has God determined to save some and not others, to have matters arranged in this way? Jesus answers this question when he says, and I quote, Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. End quote. Matthew chapter 11, verse 26. Now Jesus Christ has received all things from God the Father, all whom the Father has given to Jesus to be saved are saved. Christ has not failed to save a single one. Of course, not all are saved, for not all have been predestinated unto salvation. Some have been predestinated to damnation, but those whom have been given to Jesus Christ for salvation, those predestinated unto salvation, each and every one of them Jesus Christ died for, and saved. The Bible says, and I quote, What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory under the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. End quote. Romans chapter 9, verses 22 through 24. Jesus says no person comes to believe the gospel unless they have been given to him by the Father. Then Jesus will reveal himself to that person. This is salvation by sovereign grace alone, and that is why no Bible-believing Christian can boast. The Bible says, and I quote, 
all things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him." End quote. Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. Again, the Bible says, quote, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. End quote. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. Now comes Jesus Christ preaching to those sinners, collapsing under the guilt of their sins, and he says the following, and I quote, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. End quote. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Our Lord Jesus Christ preached the full force of God's law to his hearers. He presented the law to them. The law which demands absolute moral perfection from a man for salvation. That's the law we preached unto them. Jesus said, quote, If thou wilt enter life, keep the commandments. End quote. Matthew chapter 19, verse 17. Jesus taught, quote, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. End quote. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. You see, Jesus used the law to teach sinners that they were unable to merit salvation. They could not merit salvation in whole or in part. The first use of the law of God informs men that they are sinners in need of redemption. The Bible says, quote, Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. End quote. Romans 7 verses 7 through 10. But the first use of the law has a second part. The second part points contrite sinners, sinners crushed with the condemnation of God's law. It points them to Jesus Christ alone, to the gospel for salvation. The Bible says, and I quote, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. End quote. Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 24. Christ is pointing contrite sinners to himself when he says the following, and I quote, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. End quote. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Notice what Jesus will give those guilty sinners convinced that they cannot work their way into heaven. Jesus will give them rest. He'll give them rest. Jesus does not say he will give them rest because they have earned it. No sinner can earn Christ's salvation. No sinner deserves Christ's eternal rest and salvation. Sinners, as the law points out, deserve hell, and they have earned it. They've earned damnation with their sins. The Bible says, quote, For the wages of sin is death. End quote. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Friend, those elect under the contrition of God's law will come to Christ and be given the eternal rest of salvation. They will not be given commands from Christ to obey in order to finish meriting salvation. That's important. You need to think about that. For if Jesus gave those who were crushed by the law commands to keep that would contradict Christ's gift of eternal rest. Those who are heavy laden that come to Jesus Christ for salvation, they are given rest, not work. Jesus tells them, quote, Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. End quote. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. 
Now a yoke is a wooden cross piece placed upon the necks of two oxen usually to do the heavy work of plowing. The yoke contrite sinners bear is the yoke known as the covenant of works. The law, the moral law of God and all of its strict demands. This yoke of law condemns them and crushes them. It crushes any sinner who does not fulfill it perfectly. It makes them miserable. It makes them afraid and terrified. And it makes them weary and tired. However, the yoke of Jesus Christ is the gospel in its proper and saving sense. When contrite sinners take Jesus Christ's yoke upon them, then the moment they believe the gospel, that's how they take it upon them, the moment God causes them to believe the gospel, the moment any sinner believes the gospel of Jesus Christ, then Christ's yoke is laid upon them, that is, the free righteousness of Jesus Christ alone is laid upon them. It is imputed to them. It covers them. This saving righteousness, Christ's saving obedience, freely is credited to their accounts, justifying them before God. When we believe the gospel, we enter into the rest of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, quote, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also ceased from his own works, as God did from his. End quote. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 10. You see, when we take Christ's yoke upon us, then we do not take on us another set of laws or commands to do to obey for the meriting of our salvation. That's not what we do when we take Christ's yoke upon us when we believe the gospel. No. Instead, when we take Christ's yoke upon us, we learn who Jesus Christ is and what He alone did for our salvation. We learn the gospel and we believe it. We learn Christ is perfect God and perfect man, united in one person, conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. We learn that Jesus is our only legal surety, substitute, and mediator who lived and died in our stead, in our place, forgiving all of our sins. We learn that Jesus took the punishment for our sins on the cross expiating them, making propitiation for us, appeasing the wrath of God, turning it away from us, and taking it upon Himself. We learn that Christ is our only Redeemer, that He alone paid the ransom owed to God for us with His precious blood, freeing us from the condemnation of the law and giving us title to eternal life. Jesus ends this passage, my friends, by saying the following, and I quote, For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. End quote. Matthew chapter 11, verse 30. Why is Christ's yoke easy compared to the yoke of God's law? Why is Christ's burden light compared to the burden of the God's law, the covenant of works? Is it because Christ's yoke has fewer commands for us to obey in order to merit our salvation? That's what papists and neo-legalists pretend when they teach their false gospel of justification by faith and works. For example, the heresy of federal vision mendaciously claims that Christ's yoke is our covenant faithfulness that obtains our final justification before God, they are dead wrong. Another example is the heresy of lordship salvation. In this heresy, it wrongly says that our faith and obedience is Christ's yoke that earns final justification before God. 
men like John Piper teach that. Like the blind papists, they wickedly appeal to Romans chapter 2, verse 13, and James chapter 2, verses 20 through 26. Then they teach that we are justified before God, not by faith alone, but by faith according to the deeds of the law. That's the heresy they teach. Such is the heresy of justification by faith and works. All who call Jesus Lord and appeal to their faith and works for salvation will be damned. Jesus tells us he will say the following to the papists and neo-legalists at the day of judgment. The Bible says, quote, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name has cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. End quote. Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 through 23. You see, only those who believe the finished work of Jesus Christ alone is sufficient to save them from their sins. Only those will be saved. It is only those who trust in Christ alone that will be saved, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Only those who put on Christ's yoke will be saved. That's because Christ's yoke is easy. What does that mean? Christ's yoke is easy because Jesus Christ has already done the entire work of redemption for us. There's nothing left for us to do. Think about that. Jesus Christ, having completed the work necessary to deliver us from our sins, said, quote, It is finished. End quote. John chapter 19, verse 30. Even our belief that receives this gospel is itself the gift of God. See again Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9 and Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. Only those who take up Christ's burden will be saved. That's because Christ's burden is light. What does that mean? Christ's burden is light because he has already borne our guilt. It's already laid to his account. Christ already carried the load of our sins to the cross and satisfied entirely God's law in our place and in our stead. Christ has already accomplished our redemption, reconciling us to God. Christ's burden is light because there is nothing left for us to do. We take up Christ's burden by simply believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. For our justification. Even our believing the gospel is God's work. It's not our work. It's not something we did. The Bible says, quote, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent, in quote. John 6, 29. So let us glorify God. For our warfare against evil was accomplished by Jesus Christ alone. The Bible says, quote, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. End quote. Isaiah chapter 40 verses 1 through 2. God bless and amen.